friends, colleagues, welcome to the fourth uh, Materium online uh, physical asset NFT meetup. Uh, we have an absolutely stellar panel uh, today, and there are going to be some very exciting conversations, I think. Uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, what 2023 is going to bring to our industry and to our communities. Um, there are a couple of things that I would like to mention before we kick off. Um, first of all, uh, a disclaimer uh, that a uh, GDPR disclaimer, this is a uh, session is being recorded uh, and it will be released uh, on social media after the event. So uh, any attendees who, who who find themselves asking questions, uh, please be aware of that, that uh, by participating, you, you are agreeing to being featured uh, in this way. Um, you can interact with the panel uh, in different ways. You can post questions in the chat. Uh, there will be the opportunity to uh, speak directly uh, with each other and with the panelists at the after party, which is going to happen after we get through the through the main series of of, of conversations. Um, during the conversations, please please do post questions in the chat, and we'll try and pick uh, as many of those up as possible. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, each conversation, and then uh, Vine will uh, engage with uh, with each of the panelists. And also, please stick around until the end because there will be a uh, proof of attendance protocol uh, token, a Pope. Uh, so please do stick around uh, for that. Uh, and uh, now without further ado, uh, Dom, could you please uh, bring our next uh, speaker to the stage? I, I'm very grateful and uh, I'm happy and honored to, to introduce uh, Gordon Lau. Uh, the chief economist of Circle, which of course is one of the most significant uh, uh, organizations in our space in our industry, um, and I find it, you know, especially uh, especially uh, comforting uh, that uh, Gordon is an economist and he has the title of chief economist. My own uh, degree. Uh, included an economics element. I did uh, history and economics at university. And I do sometimes wonder whether uh, we could do with more uh, input from economists. We could do with an economist's worldview more often. So it's wonderful that he's here and he's going to share our ins his insights with us. Um, he has a short video before uh, before we speak. Ian, could you please play the video? This is what business as usual looks like. An obstacle course that could be holding your company back. From juggling time zones to currency conversion, you're locked out. The Circle account opens the door to cross-border business and faster transactions through the power of USDC. It's time to move your company at the speed of the internet and access new ways to grow. Unlock what's next with Circle. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I'd like to hand over to uh, to Gordon and to Vinay Gupta, the CEO of Materium, to take this conversation forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anton. Thanks for the warm introduction. And frankly, that was the first time I've seen that video. So uh, it's... Uh, uh, great to view it uh, for the first time with everyone here as well. Um, and thanks for mentioning that uh, the role of economists in this particular industry is quite uh, important. Um, as I think there is a lot of economics that are at the fundamental aspect of you know what token economies are, but also beyond that, you know how um, NFTs and how uh, the whole marketplace interact with the real economy which I think is what uh, Materium is about. And um, so I'm looking forward to uh, questions and conversation with Vinay. Um, so I think uh, I think it might be nice to talk a little bit about, um, uh, I mean, the whole landscape of uh, sort of dollar denominated or fiat denominated tokens uh, and the sort of discussions around things like central bank digital currency. I think that's a very hot topic for people. Um, 
I mean, you're basically the, you know, sort of most trusted dollar denominated token in the world. Um, how do you sort of see the future and what do you think will happen with central bank digital currencies and how do you think that will affect Circle? Yeah, I think, you know, we should step back one step to place where Circle is relative to how this whole industry have developed, right? Mm -hmm. So if we go back to, you know, uh, Satoshi's early paper, um, it's really about payments, cross-border payments being what stood behind Bitcoin. But very quickly, people realize that uh, being a currency, being a money, you need to satisfy certain criteria. Being a, a union of account that is stable is really valuable. And given that almost all transactions are denominated in fiat currency, having stable coin being this bridge, being this link at this moment in time to bridge between what we are used to as everyday consumers and you know, users to this new technology is very critical. Now, you know, Circle has been um, doing this for a number of years and USDC was launched um, around five years ago. And since then, I think we demonstrated that we are the most trust, trusted stablecoin out there. In part, that is because we are operating under certain regulatory framework with certain compliance and needs. And in some ways, you mentioned about CBDC, and maybe that is you know, something that is still uh, being explored, but I, I think we already have all the features that a CBDC could bring uh, in that you know, we are able to offer cross-border instantaneous settlement uh, with relatively low cost, with relatively um, good protection of privacy, yet having enough transparency uh, that you know, policymakers could have some comfort with it. Um, at the same time, I, I think there is a large push uh, towards central bank digital currency as you know, the public sector also realized that there's immense value in the technology that's being developed in the space. So you see now examples of different central banks having experiments that's basically working some of the DeFi protocols in Project Guardian in uh, Singapore, as well as Project Mariana in, in Europe, are examples of which are related to this concept of private sector leading the innovation, but maybe some part of this innovation will be adopted into the public sector. But I don't think it's necessarily um, a, a substitute in any way, uh, because fundamentally you're addressing a different set of market, different type of users, and have very different features, uh, for instance, most likely, I think in majority of central banks are evaluating central bank digital currency, but mostly they're thinking about wholesale. So usage of central bank digital currency by large financial institutions rather than by retail. On the retail side, it's been very limited in terms of uh, both the exploration, but also frankly, in terms of the capability of central banks uh, being able to innovate at a cutting edge in offering you know, the user experience that everyday users want to engage with. Mm -hmm. And not too long ago, uh, Fabio Panetta from the ECB made a speech and he clearly said uh, the European CBDC, if it comes about, would not have programmability as a feature. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, completely just you know, limits the type of usage that uh, that sort of CBDC could, could be used for. Uh, is, it will be strictly for payments, but not for uh, the vast majority of programmability features that you know those who are in the industry find really valuable. I think the stat that I recently uh, looked at was roughly 60% of USDC transactions are interacting with smart contracts in some way. So wow. those sort of smart contract transactions um, are representing programmability, right? That that's is absolutely, that's absolutely part. amazing. That's a huge number. Yeah, and you noted that part of the smart contract interaction might be with smart contract wallets mm -hmm. that are doing simple payments, but these wallets also have uh, different ways of, you know, um, having, uh, say, multiple signature or multiple verifications. So I, I think it, it should be kept in mind that the type of innovation that USDC is representing is not just faster, cheaper payment, but rather this interaction as a software layer uh, with developers all around the world, including you. Yep. 
Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, that is very interesting. I mean, the sort of, the, the reason this is up in the UK is that there's a new announcement by Bank of England saying that they're foreseeing, you know, a central bank digital currency sometime right. within the next decade, um, which is a kind of, you know, I would say a, a British code word for, you know, just to hold this space for about 15 years is usually how we would interpret that. Um, and, you know, the UK is in a kind of tricky position because the sort of, Assumption was that post Brexit we would see an enormous amount of deregulation and innovation, uh, resulting in a model that people called Singapore on Thames, uh, and instead we seem to have opted for an option which uh, is sort of locally known as Brussels on Thames. Um, so you know we're in a sort of position where we're sort of looking at this with CBDCs and like it would be nice, but the expectation is that the delivery will literally take ten years when it arrives it will probably be something that is restricted to banks and maybe Fortune 500 companies. Um, you know, it's very hard for us to imagine the Bank of England doing something that would interfere in the function of the high street banks, for example. And if they were essentially issuing um, central bank digital currency to retail, they'd be cutting the high street banks completely out of the issue of money creation and this kind of stuff. Uh, I think it's yeah, much think more disruptive than they're ready to do. Absolutely. And one large concern with central bank digital currency, obviously, is you know, is the central bank going to also provide credit for everyday consumers and everyday businesses and effectively replacing um, depository institutions on high street, as you mentioned. Yeah. And I, I think that concern is really hard to address from a central bank perspective. You really do need the innovations that go on in the private sector, you know, for instance, tokenizing real world asset and making lending and credit protocols available uh, based on those assets rather than you know addressing it from a single-handed large balance sheet of a single institution uh, type of perspective mm -hmm. it's a little bit like um there was quite a bit of discussion in the early days of cloud about whether or not nation states would mount their own cloud infrastructure uh, so there was a question about whether cloud is a thing that ought to have been handled in the same way as for example postal services are typically nationalized or at one period, teleco telcos were nationalized. So there is this sort of question of what the line is between sort of government-run national infrastructure in a kind of critical infrastructure sense, and what is actually best left to the markets. And certainly, central bank digital currency seems to head in a direction that most governments have uh, been steering away from in the last 20 years. You know, they've the, the governments have mostly headed for a commercialized uh, approach <clears throat> where most of the critical infrastructure provision is actually done by corporations, it's very rare to see a government nationalize anything. Um, so the idea that the government would mount their own sort of retail-facing cryptocurrency, you know, CBDC tokens, and they would have government app for moving that stuff around, and they would do consumer finance, uh, it, it seems very hard to imagine that they would do that uh, from a policy perspective. Yeah, absolutely right about that. And we've seen early examples of failures of governments uh, mm -hmm. try to push for that vision. You know, the e y that was deployed in China is a good example of central bank made a large effort in developing uh, digital currency that will be used by broad retail. But the adoption has fallen flat outside of some incentives early on. And that is a signal that, you know, the everyday consumers also value um, having certain amount of privacy, especially in, in China, that uh, you wouldn't necessarily want government entities to um, be able to directly see every single transaction without, you know, court order, without the rule of law, uh, the same way that, you know, you, you have that sort of structure. Um, I think in the U.S., we would never get there uh, just by nature of, you know, we are standing for democracy and freedom. And I, I think it's really hard for um, for the country to move towards that direction. Uh, Europe is probably somewhere in between, um, in all honesty, although um, the latest uh, reports out of uh, the European institutions also indicate privacy being a key feature that they want to preserve. Mm -hmm. um, but I also do ask the question of, you know, what, how different is it to, uh, for instance, just the current payment rail uh, in the U.S., the FedNow system will come online later this year um, with expanded access with potentially more institutions. And that probably is just closer to what is known as wholesale CBDC. And 
if that's already existent, then what additional innovation could CBDC really bring? Yeah, is, is does Fedwire move around uh, U.S. government central bank money, or does it move around bank money? So uh, how you know bank money get moved around fundamentally is the crediting and debiting of their reserve account at the central bank. Oh, okay. uh, that's also why cross-border payments, which we didn't go into, is really difficult because you're basically trying to credit and debit uh, the balance sheet of different central banks for different banks that have multiple jurisdictions. Yeah, I see, I see. Got it. That makes sense. Um, so let's talk very briefly about um, inflation uh, and then real world assets. Let's start with inflation. So over the past couple of years, you know, well, I mean, since 2008, we've been waiting for the inflation thing to happen. You know, I remember talking to other folks that were interested in uh, the sort of dynamics of um, things like failed states and economic collapses, basically saying like, yeah, they can print money until the inflation starts. And then there was a very long period in which there was ferocious money printing and no inflation which we found highly counterintuitive. The best explanation we ever came to was that imaginary money was canceling imaginary debts, and therefore there was just no impact on inflation. Finally, the inflation arrives. Um, what do you think the impact of inflation is going to be on stablecoins, and what are the options available to stablecoin providers to kind of manage the inflation problem? Yeah, I think the impact on stablecoins is twofold. One is... Um, obviously, central banks are responding uh, to inflation by raising interest rate. So that naturally sets a higher opportunity cost for holding stable coins that are, uh, by construct, yielding zero interest. Um, so the current spread we see between the risk-free rate that you can get in fiat market on T-bills and on stable coins, which is yielding zero, is indicative of that convenience yield that demand for stablecoin, that people are willing to give up a certain mm -hmm. percentage just to have that convenience of having stablecoin. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, in the international angle, there's a lot of arguments being made where inflation is actually a, a positive for demand for stablecoin. Um, because if you think about where inflations are most acute, is in places like Latin America or you know, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, emerging markets that have inflation in the double digits. And in these economies, to manage inflation well, it's, of course, part of the, uh, the, the mandate of the local central bank. But also from a consumer perspective, they much rather have a stable store of value, a stable source of asset. And that oftentimes is dollar or uh, sometimes digital form, form of dollar, which is why you know the circulation of US dollar is around $2.2 trillion in physical dollar bills. About 1.8 uh, trillion is in $100 bills. And that's mostly perhaps in emerging market, but nobody really knows. Mm -hmm. And we do think that there is a huge opportunity to just replace that you know, $2.2 trillion of physical dollar bills with the digital version that's tokenized on blockchain. I see. Uh, that's interesting. I see. So it begins, it begins to look more like cash. In the sense exactly. of it has the same role inside of the economy, uh, uh, whatever it is, I can't remember where cash fits as M1 or something. Uh, yeah, um, I like to call, I like to refer USDC to oftentimes as tokenized cash, not only because it has cash like properties, that is a very instrument, it's easy to uh, transfer, it has some privacy preservation, but also because the asset holdings are one to one fully backed with cash equivalent type of assets, such as short term T bills. So um, now, you know, you, you yeah, bring it true. back to the physical asset NFT space. I think it makes a lot of sense for right now, NFTs, a lot of them are traded, you know, denominated in ETH. But mm -hmm. if you really try to link it to the physical world where there's a price of good for those physical NFT, uh, physical asset type of NFTs to be denominated in something like uh, tokenized cash, such as USDC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's certainly what we found. So uh, the uh, dollar denominated uh, pricing is a, a critical feature for almost everybody selling physical assets. Um, so we did some gold transactions uh, last year and all of that stuff was USDC. Uh, we currently have a 1.9 million pound, so roughly $2 million land plot on sale. This is also USDC. 
uh, in a lot of ways, USDC is just the sort of de facto way of pricing anything which is going to be linked to real world assets. Um, because kind of sort of how else would you do it? Yep. Um, in, unless you start doing kind of weird stuff where the assets are priced in dollars and then you've got some kind of price oracle and then you're making payments in Bitcoin. You know, you, you can see schemes like that where maybe you have something like Chainlink in the middle. Um, but it introduces a bunch of risk that you're not taking if you simply nail the asset and a price down in dollars. I, I think you hit a nail on the head that, you know, the dollar and by proxy tokenized forms of the dollar will continue to remain as the dominant currency for the foreseeable future. And that means, you know, trading assets are especially have real world consequence and relevance in something that's closer to the dollar is uh, it's probably the best way to go there. And in terms of the kind of um, real world asset space, how does Circle look at the future of real world assets? Uh, I had a brief interaction with Jeremy Allaire, CEO of Twitter, um, where he retweeted one of, uh, well, tweeted out one of the Materium sort of thought leadership pieces called at the turning point. Uh, and he said, you know, what we have is, you know, real crappy assets, what we need tokenized real world assets, USDC is tip of the spear. Um, you know, what do you think the future of real world assets is like? And what do you think Circle's role is in that? Yeah, I think he's absolutely right that, you know, stablecoin and USDC specifically is the tip of a spear in terms of tokenizing real world asset. But I think that is real world asset, broadly speaking, is where the real opportunities are in terms of bringing utility value out of crypto. We have seen so much of these, you know, tokenization of uh, various type of you know, DAOs or, or interest in Web3 space developed naturally. And this has been great in developing the apparatus, in developing the platforms for decentralized finance. But the use cases for the vast majority of mainstream users has been relatively narrow. Right? But by tokenizing real world assets, starting with cash and perhaps then with many other items, uh, you could really leverage this whole infrastructure that's been built up uh, over the last couple of years. I mean, th this is exactly why I started Materium. Um, you know, I was at the Ethereum Foundation 2014, 2015, <clears throat> project managed the launch, did a lot of the early writing and teaching about what Ethereum was. Um, but it was apparent to me at the time that if we didn't figure out how to get at the real art world assets, the blockchain was going to be a little all dressed up and no place to go. Um, you know, we had already seen that Bitcoin was highly volatile because it was hard to exchange for physical things. It was the price was kind of untethered. Um, so I set out to go and build the necessary kind of legal technical infrastructure to get the real world assets there, essentially with the expectation that this was going to be critical to promoting Materium's genuine utility. And we thought it was going to take two years to get to market with that, and it took almost four. Uh, and then two years since then of gradually building more expensive uh, kind of use cases. Um, but in the long run, you know, we think that the real world asset economy is, you know, it's, it's sort of the, the fundamental use case for the blockchain, because it's the market that is least well served by the existing systems. You know, there are all kinds of commodities for which there's no bourse, there's no exchange, second hand markets are inefficient, real estate is a nightmare to transact. And, you know, that's ballpark 10, 20, maybe even 30 billion uh, trillion dollars a year of transactions for which there is a need for market infrastructure, but there is no market infrastructure. Uh, and we think that, you know, in this sense, we're sort of at that turning point where the initial speculative uses of the blockchain are tending to explode. And then the next phase of the development in the kind of Perez model will be the sort of phase where the industry matures and grows up and it becomes a much more kind of diligent, much more sensible place. Absolutely. I think you're right there. Um, so I don't want so, to take up too much time, but I see there are some questions. Should I reserve those for the end or? Um, yeah, why don't we take them now uh, and then we'll wrap up and go on to the next speaker. Um, sure. Thomas, can we get you up? Or, or we could read out Thomas's question. Yeah, but if we can get Thomas up, let's get him up. Uh, Dom, are you able to bring Thomas to the floor, please? Thank you. Uh, so to uh, Thomas used to run a thing called um, Barcamp Bank, which was sort of a series of workshops and kind of hackathon type events in London. 
must have been almost 15 years ago that became the sort of back, uh, the sort of incubator for a lot of the thinking that then manifested as fintech companies in London. I think that's fair to say. Uh, Thomas, have we gotten you up on stage? Um, yeah, we've, we have Thomas. Can Fantastic. So, yeah, loud and clear. Excellent. I'm, I'm glad I'm not on video because I don't have like a fancy background and everything. Um, but yeah, um, I used to run uh, Barcamp Bank London, which was an offshoot of Barcamp Bank Paris, strangely enough. And yeah, I mean, that was, oh, that was like, that was 15 years ago, but the term fintech didn't really exist because you just had a couple of random companies in London and it just wasn't enough for you to have a, a sector or apply a name to it. Mm. Um, so at the time I had just finished working for a company called Zopa, which used to uh, broker loans directly between individuals on the internet. Um, still around, a um, bit of a different business model now. But yeah, there was, there was a lot of discussions in that about the nature of money and creating money but of course this was before blockchains existed so all of that stuff was around setting up web servers where you could keep monetary balances and we had a lot of people coming over from places like time banks um i remember there was um, there was somebody who told a very amusing story about a time banking system that was set up in the uk where you know you do an hour's worth of work and you get an hour credit and you can exchange that for other people's skills uh, and the organizers fell out and they actually forked the time bank um, they ended up with two organizations and one of them stole a copy of the other one's database uh, so they had a contentious fork and people had to decide which one they were going to follow that's amazing, <laughs> amazing I mean, how, much of, how much of this stuff has actually come up before there was any technology to do it easily uh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that is a, an incubator for the stuff that went on to form the bedrock of the London fintech scene. Like, I mean, those events were jam packed. When I, when I went into Ethereum Foundation, it was with a head full of ideas that I'd gotten out of the conversations of Bar Camp Bank. Very significant. What was your, um, what was your question? Um, oh, me. Uh, my question I put in there, let me pull my exact. Oh, this disappeared off the list. Never mind. Um, I think I remember what I said. So my, my, my question is fundamentally, and I re I, 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 I'm sort of, I'm looking for the hypothetical answer. I realize if there was a concrete one, you probably couldn't give it here. Um, but has, would, would Circle consider issuing a token that was based against maybe an index or a commodity? Sort of like the, the bank or concept where it's a certain amount of wheat, a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of labor. And I suspect the answer is no, but I'm quite curious what you think the prerequisites would be for that to be a viable thing to do. I think the prerequisite, the key prerequisite is having regulatory clarity on what exactly you're tokenizing and how it would fit into the local security rules. You know, in the US, there is very clear rules about what is considered security and if it's tokenized security, how you know, it would, I think it would mean many different things, um, specifically in interpreting the rule regarding the transfer restrictions and, you know, what, what it could be possibly used for. Um, I think under, this is my personal understanding is if you were to issue things that resemble security today without having a security offering that would just fall flat completely. But if you do follow the security rules, then it's a very limited type of usage of what that token could be used for. Uh, so again, it is not really viable. So I would say just the prerequisite for any sort of um, tokens that are against the index is to consider, are, would this be considered a security and under you know, what type of legal framework this would be under. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you very much, Gordon. Thank you. Um, um, all right, I think uh, we can move on to our next speaker. Gordon, thank you so much, and I thank hope you'll you. stick around for the after party so folks can can interact uh, a little bit more directly. Um, Fantastic having you. Dom, thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Dom, could we could we get uh, James Burney up on the stage, please? Um, we are oh, very pleased. 
we we are we are very pleased uh, that uh, our friend our colleague uh, James Burney has been able to join us. James Burney is a partner at uh, the law firm uh, Gunner Cook and is one of the preeminent uh, lawyers in the UK and possibly the world uh, specializing in uh, a lot of the issues that we're discussing and with a particular focus on our industry and on our community. And I hope, uh, because I, 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 I've, I've seen James uh, sharing on LinkedIn quite a lot of information recently, that James will be able to tell us about what's coming in 2023 in terms of regulation, not just in the UK, but globally. It seems that there are uh, several jurisdictions which are now moving quite quickly, and there are definitely changes coming. Uh, welcome, James. Hi, good to meet you. Good to be here. Um, so, yeah, the first question, I guess, is... Uh, what do you see coming in 2023 in terms of uh, regulation, uh, particularly perhaps from jurisdictions uh, which uh, previously weren't focused so much on this? Sure. So at the moment, we're seeing a shift change inspired in part by FTX, which Superficially, if you read the press, it's the end of the world as we know it, but actually has been quite good from a regulatory perspective, mainly because the issues in FTX were traditional issues that regulators know and love and know how to deal with. And therefore, when we're speaking to regulators, there's almost more confidence in the room because they know what the problems are which they need to resolve. They've been resolved before and they can be resolved again. What we're getting is we're getting, therefore, certain people coming out the woodwork. So you've got jurisdictions which are well known as being pro-crypto. You've got jurisdictions which are well known for being more anti-crypto. What we're beginning to see now are new players coming onto the pitch who are trying to take a position in between the two of sensible and positive regulation. We were involved during last year with writing the Mauritian legal and regulatory framework, and that has been in some ways influenced by Chad Five principles, as are all the new frameworks. The quest at the moment on that side was to create what we call the level two, the actual core specific rules which are there, which are lacking most of the jurisdictions. Last In the last couple of weeks, we've seen Kazakhstan starting to go down the same route. And Kazakhstan, of course, is a large Bitcoin mining community, and that effectively means that there is quite a lot of action on the crypto scene in Kazakhstan. And we're beginning to see other African natures begin to wake up and do the same thing. And a lot of this is sort of putting the other layer one, putting in the original reaction. And when you speak to different regulators about this, what they're effectively doing is they are copying each other 80 to 90 percent and then taking that last 10 to 20 percent. And that is their specialism. But that is what that, that jurisdiction wants to have. So, for example, it might be they want to do crypto funds. It may be they want to do mining. It may be they want to be staking. In the UK, it is a lot of it's about stable coins effectively at the moment is one of the quires of focus. The other thing we're seeing at the moment, which is going to be the kind of key battleground for the next couple of years, is all around advertising. And this actually has quite a long historical precedent. So if you take the traditional hedge fund industry, hedge funds had difficulty existing in the traditional regulatory framework. They then moved offshore to say Cayman Islands and BVI. And then they are regulated when they come into a country onshore, and that is the touch point for regulating hedge funds on the onshore side. We've seen it, we're now seeing the same happening with crypto assets. And the question is, what should that framework look like? So if you take the UK, there'll be quite a long process, including things like cooling off periods, stopping retail, putting more than 10% of the assets into fungible tokens. It's going to be a process designed to protect people. Now, that sounds quite heavy handed. But do you really think that you should have retail people running around putting the last of their savings into crypto assets? It may be a thing in the long term. And if you want to be contrarian, you can almost argue that this is a positive push towards people saying you should have some of your assets in crypto assets as part of diversification. And you can read the rules completely opposite to the way which the press has, which is actually there's an indication here there should be some diversification and it should be up to 10%. So it's those sort of law of unintended consequences. And so you've got, first of all, you can have disclosure requirements. We've seen those, they've been developed, they come together. And the second order is a process 
designed to protect people. And when you sit on the spectrum as to how supportive you are on this, it depends on how much you want to protect them. And you've got the old fashioned guys sitting in going, let's just do it like equity. We know and love equity. And then you've got the DeFi, DGN, NFT brigade going, no, this is entirely different. And again, you know, one of the more interesting things we've seen in the papers coming out is the move to regulate crypto assets you know, in some ways may not apply to NFTs, which are not acting what they call a financial activity. Now, if we know what financial activity is, you get a gold star, because I sure as hell don't know what they mean by that. But I think we can guess that what they're trying to get at here is an NFT, which is a pitch or a members club or something like that, is not really the sort of thing they're after. What they're after is if it looks like a duck and squats like a duck, let's regulate it as a duck. So if it looks like a security, let's head to go in that direction. The last thing I just will point out is on the security side, bear in mind that you're getting these different variations. And again, if you take, you know, something like the Howey test in the US, that is a very specific US type approach. The German and the UK have different variations on this. And if we go in different countries, you're going to get different answers on this slightly, which opens up and locks down who you can market to in each jurisdiction, which at the end makes everything nice and complicated because let's face it, we love it when regulation is complicated as possible, as my clients tell me every day. One of them actually says that, I think I'll die of shock. <laughs> We have a question from the floor, uh, Katten. I think you've identified uh, that. Could you could you ask it, uh, please? Can we hear Katten? Yeah, you can do. Uh, yeah. I've sent it uh, through, but it's from Gracie asking James, why are regulators focused on fraud in this in this sector when fraud is so apparent in other financial sectors? A good observation good question i thought you may want to have a go at it andrew awesome marketing by trad five it's a short answer um <laughs> the one i love was when hsbc announced that they didn't like the fact there's all this dodgy stuff going in the world of crypto and at the same time got a fine large in the entirety of the entire of crypto for money laundering for mexican cartel in mexico the short answer here is the Old money laundering and crypto regular uh, uh, ecosystem has two distinct uh, things. The first one is it's far too bloody good for its own good. So to take a step back, if you take the Bitcoin, you can trace it all the way back to the Genesis block, and you can take the view the Genesis block was a act of treason because it was an attempt to create a form of currency in competition with traditional pound of the sterling. This is treason in various countries, including sort of the UK. If you take that view, anything created since the Genesis block is the proceeds of crime. Anyone who's ever held a Bitcoin has handled the proceeds of crime. If your computer has ever had a Bitcoin uh, operators on it, it has been involved in assisting people uh, do the proceeds of crime and so we can go on and on and on because you've got this beautiful transparent chain now i want to talk about the 20 pound note if you take the 20 pound note and you stick it in a machine to look for drugs 80 percent of 20 pound notes in the uk have got traces of cocaine on them and therefore on that basis we could argue that 80 percent of 20 pound notes have been involved in money laundering and therefore, every time you buy a pet sandwich, it should be checked for cocaine. And if you buy your pet sandwich using a cocaine tainted 20 pound notes, you've now just had done the process of crime to acquire a sandwich. Nobody's doing that. And the reason nobody's doing it is it's so much bloody work. So mm. the fact the first issue is it's so easy to look for money laundering. And the more you look, the more you find you have an intrinsic issue. It's just too easy to find problems. The second thing is a pure accent of history which is when these rules, when people look to regulate against, uh, well, they want to regulate crypto, going through the European Parliament at the time was the money laundering directive. And the Europeans go at a certain speed. So when they're all doing money laundering, we're all doing money laundering that year. And because we're all doing money laundering that year, the conversations about money laundering, crypto turned up, so we're going to do it on the money laundering. And if you look at a lot of the issues in the UK, a lot of it is about the regulator not having the right tools for the job. And this is why the new things come in the last couple of weeks are quite exciting, because we're now going to give people the right tools for the job. And that could be quite a game changer because people calm down when they have the right tools for the job. So a lot of this is, is bad timing because it, the crypto came out effectively at the same time as the MLD5. So everyone, all anyone could think about was money laundering at that point. 
It's great PR by people who announce it's all dodgy money laundering. It's making it too easy to, to, to look for problems. And lastly, to be blunt, the money laundering rules are simply out of date. So if you become my client, I ask for KYC, I get your passport, I get your name, I get where you were born, I get your age, all things I bluntly do not care and do not want to know about. What I want to know about is, am I representing bin Laden? Because I'm not that keen to represent bin Laden. If I'm uh, representing a sort of chap, I'm a happy guy. So these rules are out of date and they're based in a world where there was a fundamental question, which was, if you are dodgy, why wouldn't you just give the information across? And if you don't give the information across, it's a sign of being dodgy. That predates GDPR. That predates identity fraud. It's an entirely old concept which still exists. And the psychological problem in the room is when these rules were written, there was no good reason not to give the data across as far as anyone was concerned. Now there are good reasons. I think there's a fundamental question as to whether the traditional rules should be reevaluated in light of what's really going on, particularly, as Grace, as you say, the, the evidence from their work of their working is exactly zero at the moment. People get around them. Um, I know that's, um, Ian sorry, Grigg, uh, I know Ian Grigg is a, a huge fan of a different approach. Um, you know, Ian thinks that basically we need to look at the transactions uh, on a very different basis from trying to just simply verify identities. Um, so if you have a sea of small, unproblematic transactions, you don't care whose they are, but you look at the big stuff in an enormous amount of detail, transaction by transaction. Do you think that is a kind of viable way forward on AML? So this is all about proportionality, and no regulator gets can get their head around proportionality. Regulators mm. just want to stop money laundering. Mm. What you end up with tools is they go, well, it's 90% clean, or 80% clean, or 20% clean. And well, the other way around is it was 10% dodgy, so you shouldn't be doing it. So you enter into this sort of debate whereby you're basically giving it a sort of probability as to how dodgy you think it might be. Mm -hmm. And that is a very bad sell compared to the alternative, which is he's definitely okay. That might be totally wrong, but they're totally convinced he's a definitely an okay, sodded kind of chap. And so putting it on to people saying, we're going to, we are going to accept 10% money laundered funds because we think that is acceptable is a hard sell politically in a world where we just to want everyone, we're just going to stop money laundering. Right, Nobody right. gets a gold star for let, let's allow some money laundering in the room. Um, and, and that's the issue we walk into. I think in the future, we're going to have to go down this route. I think it's the only viable route out there. And I think we're going to have to bite the bullet. But you almost want a generational shift in terms of thinking at the people at the top, because effectively, the guys at the top are the old fashioned. You get a piece of paper, you tick a box, money laundering is gone move forward. Why would I accept a world where I'm going to let people money launder? Got it. Got it. Huh. Uh, this is... Oh, sorry. No, this no, go on. I'm, 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 I'm conscious of, of the time. So, so Vinay, please, one more okay. question. Well, I, I was just going to say this is very reminiscent of how we handle, um, you know, things like uh, contamination food chains. You know, with modern techniques, you could find, you know, one part of, uh, you know, insect remains per 100,000 tons of pepper or something like that. And at some point, you just have to draw a threshold and say, you know, there's always going to be a trace. Here's our threshold to trace everything under that is fine. Uh, back to you, Anton. Uh, I was going to say, uh, James, uh, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you will stick around for the uh, for the after party so that folks can uh, interact with you directly. Um so yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It's been uh, very informative and uh, as as always fascinating. Thank you. Um, thank you. Good to see you. Uh, Dom, could we please uh, bring uh, Federico to the stage, please? No. Um, we're very happy to have uh, Fede Pomi here uh, from uh, Fabrica. Uh, who work with uh, real estate and specifically real estate uh, as NFTs. Uh, and they've been doing it for quite some time. They have a very interesting legal solution in the US for this, which I really look forward to hearing about uh, in more detail. Um, I understand that, uh, Feder, you don't have a video, but you may want to share your screen to show some materials. Uh, welcome, Fede. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me, first of all. 
And uh, correct. So what we hi Vinay. Uh, what we do in very short few words is that we turn real land into NFTs. And what it means is that uh, we enable uh, real estate transactions to be performed fully within the Web3 uh, ecosystem. So just to give you a sense of what it looks like, that's an NFT of a real plot of land in Santa Cruz. And you can see it's for sale in USDC. You could put it for sale in Ether or any other cryptocurrencies, but it's supported by OpenSea. And we gather all the data about the, the property, so to represent it properly. And more importantly, we take care of bridging the digital asset with the real world assets from a, from a legal uh, standpoint. So that's just as an introduction to what we do. Yes, fantastic. Really, really used to see. So um, tell us a little bit about the project, because you've been around for years, and we only discovered you very recently. Yes. So... We started this in 2018. So we've been quietly building. <laughs> uh, and the first plot of land that we that we brought on chain was the one that you just seen in Santa Cruz in 2018. That's where how we started experimenting this. Mm -hmm. We realized that clearly the regulatory framework wasn't ready for that. And we the only way to do it was to go out there, go to the county and test it. And we started testing first in one county then in whole California, then we expanded to more states and we're now licensing about 20 states to do it. Hmm. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, you. so Materium obviously has a very similar uh, thing that we do. We've we've just done our first real estate listing uh, and you know we're, we're focused a lot on kind of description of goods, like how do you know when the roof has fallen in, this kind of stuff. But we started exactly as you started with land because it was just much easier to do the legal definition of and then on the back end there's a kind of uh, contraption involving you know option contracts and spvs and there's quite mm -hmm. a bit of legal machinery and legal complexity there uh and that stuff holds up okay but one of the things that we've been looking at is using trust structures and uh before we talked um uh, a little you know before before the session started you were telling me a little bit about the trust structures that you guys are using could you expand a little bit about just the sort of the magic that enables you to take an nft transaction and have it show up in a land register as a, as a legible event like how is this miracle accomplished <laughs> yes of course so first why a trust structure because you can't go just to the county or any state so far and say, hey, this property is an NFT. They will look at you and like, what, what, what are you even saying? What, what, the, what is it? So we had to put like a legal container for the property. So at the local jurisdiction, we record each property into a, a container. We use a trust. And that trust is uh, written in a way that states that whoever is in possession of a specific NFT that represents that trust becomes both the beneficiary and trustee of the trust. So in essence, the property at a county is in the name of a trust. You mm -hmm. get an NFT, and that NFT can be freely transferred from one person to another. The moment that you are in possession of the NFT, you become the beneficiary and trustee of the trust. So, so you buy just, the trust, you own the property. So just for our audience, right? So the trust is a corporation. Um, it's it's yeah, a, kind of <laughs> similar to a corporation. Not exactly a corporation. So what is a trust in this context? Because this is, I think this is super interesting for people that are interested in physical assets. Like what is the legal container? Yes. So trusts are pretty flexible uh, legal instruments that can be used for different purposes. You can use them for estate purposes or uh, to hold uh, any kind of assets, basically. We mm -hmm. have customly designed one that is specifically built to hold a real estate asset and represent it with a digital asset. So from a from a jurisdictional perspective, that's like an entity for mm -hmm. some uh, aspects of it, but it's closer to individual property and personal property for other uh, from another perspective. So for oh, example, from a tax perspective, it's a completely disregarded entity. It's like owning the property directly. Okay. Oh, that's fascinating. So it's in some instances it's like a pass through, but in other instances it actually has a legal identity. Yes, correct. It's, so the trust is transferable property in some sense. Yes, correct. Got it. So you have this entity, the trust. The trust then shows up on the land register as being the owner of the property. Yes, at a county record. In the US, there's a slightly different system from what you have in the UK. So there's no concept of land registry. 
as a recording system. So the county on the state doesn't give you any guarantee on the property. You yeah. use the recorder almost as an offline database, let me say. You record a deed there. And in the deed, it says that the property is held by the trust. Mm -hmm. And that's all that happens at the county. From that moment on, transactions are on chain. And uh, from an offline perspective, the property is always in the name of a trust, no matter how many transactions you perform on chain. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. So and then, you know, so somebody has the NFT. What's the relationship between the NFT, the person that owns the NFT, and the uh, legal structure of the trust? Like, how does that part work? The person in possession of the NFT is the beneficiary and trustee of a trust. So mm -hmm. they have full rights to the property. They can do whatever they want with it. It's like owning it directly. I see. So legally speaking, the transfer of the NFT transfers control of the trust, and then that allows them to do something like they could change the ownership of the property on the uh, at the county office, this kind of stuff. At the county office, it stays in the name of a trust. Mm -hmm. Um, but you are the person, it's like a holding entity that you fully control. So uh, you own the property through the trust, even if the county shows up in the name of a trust. Got it, got it. It's a fantastic system. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, what kind of uses are people using the system for? Like, what are people doing with it? So uh, that's a very good question. So at the beginning, we started with uh, land traders. So there's a pretty active community in the U.S., of customers who has who have used this system to buy and sell plots of land all around the US. So we have tokenized, so to speak, a few hundreds property, almost 300 properties mm -hmm. across several count, uh, several states. And uh, our customers have been using that to buy and sell land easily online. We are now going more toward like crypto audience and enabling all kinds of operations on those assets. So I think what's very important to say is that yes, transactions are one thing, and let me expand that. Like, if you look at a real estate transaction in the US, if you have a $1 million asset, real asset that you want to transfer, that costs roughly five to $10,000 to transfer it, which is insane. If you consider any other asset class, stocks or a wire transfer, imagine like pay, paying like $5,000 to, to move $1 million of, of, as a transfer, that would be insane. In mm -hmm. the real estate, that's completely acceptable. Uh, which is wrong, honestly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, there's a massive opportunity <clears throat> for us to make those transactions happen within seconds and for a fraction of the cost. And that's just the first step. The second step is what can you do with those digital assets, which is way more powerful than just the transaction. And I'm talking about like using it as collateral, clearly, or having DAOs owning real estate. So having automated entity being able to buy and sell properties or create fractions out of those properties, bundle them together and create funds and so on. So you can basically rebuild the whole industry on, on a new digital system. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, th this this question of like modernizing the existing land registries, there's what, something like, what, two and a half trillion dollars a year of land transfers occur? Land and buildings, property, this kind of stuff. It's, so it's a staggeringly large market. Yeah, it's, it's, believe it or not, it's a tricky question because we know the numbers for like residential transactions are very visible. Land is a different beast, uh, but what you can, if you want to keep it simple, like all land assets in the world is about like $300 trillion asset class. It's massive and it runs on a legacy system. Every single country that you look at, I mean, US is just one. At UK, you have like oh. <laughs> some first world, first world countries are pretty decent with land That's, rights. Yeah. Third world is a completely oh, different whole, story and it then impacts, impacts the whole economy. So if you <laughs> find a way to enable first world, second world or third world countries to unlock the capital that is locked mm. within those plots of land or real estate property, that's a massive opportunity for everyone. Yeah. There's an amazing book about that, which I'm sure you've read, The Mystery yeah. of Capital by Hernando yes. de Soto. Uh, I was lucky enough to spend a couple of days with him uh, at an event maybe four or five years ago. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's just, it's such a refreshing perspective, you know, that if you could get this stuff properly registered, you could get people into the legal system. It just changes their rights, their, their outcomes. Um, and, that, you know, that is a, 
that is a long-term objective of just sorting out the land rights mess. It is a civil liberties, civil rights problem all across the world. Mm -hmm. The people live on land that they have no legal identity for, they have no legal claim on the land, and they lose their land because somebody else comes along, files a bunch of paperwork and pushes them off it, and they have no paperwork to take to court to counter, uh, counterbalance that. They can't fight for their land with a claim. So the idea of getting all that stuff properly documented, I think, is, is a phenomenally powerful concept. Um, uh, Anton. Um, uh, yes, yeah. yeah, so I'm conscious of the time. Uh, so uh, if we could conclude Fede's segment for now, and then Fede, I hope you'll be able to stick around for the for the after party, which will be on separate Zoom link, and perhaps uh, some of the audience can ask you questions directly uh, at that point. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, uh, absolutely really fantastic. fascinating. Super interesting. Uh, Thank you so much, guys. Really, really good having you here. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm super impressed with the work that you folks have done in terms of like the number of transactions and the legal sophistication. Really good, really inspiring. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you, Fede. Uh, and now, uh, Dom, if you could please invite Eric to the stage. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, we have with us uh, renowned artist, uh, AI pioneer, a uh, good friend of uh, Materium, uh, somebody who I respect hugely, uh, Eric Drass, Shardcore. Um, no conversation about 2023 would be complete without uh, talking about AI and what is going to happen in that arena and how that's going to affect uh, our industry and our community. Um, and uh, I can think of no better person than Eric to to share some thoughts about that with us. I understand Eric has a video, first of all. So Ian, perhaps we could put that video on first and then uh, Eric and Finnick can have a conversation. I've been painting all my life and I've been coercing computers into making art for me for nearly as long. Recent advances in AI, in both the understanding and creation of images, has birthed a new kind of aesthetic built from the mind of the internet. As an artist, I see these images as exciting and inspirational, but they can also in some ways be seen as a threat. This series of paintings investigates this tension. They are the result of a collaboration between me and my AI assistant, who I call Vic. I ask Vic to dream up images based on my chosen parameters and then select and manipulate the results before finally choosing the composition that inspires the painting. The act of painting becomes another kind of collaboration between the decisions made by the machine and the decisions I make as a painter. We guide and challenge each other and I think of the results as a truly collaborative process. Vic's mind is a neural network model trained on text and images harvested from the internet. What emerges are insights into the subconscious of the internet, simultaneously alien and familiar. After all, the internet is a reflection of ourselves. The world of art is always changing. Culture is hungry for new ideas, for new aesthetic experiences and new ways of seeing. And I guess it's quite an unusual combination, having an interest in something traditional like painting and something more modern like AI. If a machine can do all this work, what's left for the artist? It seems to me the only response is to pick up a brush and paint, to own that image for yourself to bring the humanity back into it. Hey, how's it going, sir? It's going very well. How are you? Thanks. Uh, I am uh, quite happy. This is going to, this has been a very good event so far, and I'm expecting the weirdness to go through the roof now. <laughs> um, so tell me for starters, how long have you been messing around with AI and image generation and the rest of this kind of stuff? And how did you get started in that? So uh, I guess the story dates back to uh, my PhD, which was in neural network models of language acquisition uh, back in the 90s. And in those days, a neural network had a few hundred units and ran on a 
a machine. It would take weeks to run, uh, but it was used as a kind of biologically plausible model of the mind. Mm. Um, I moved on to do various other things involving stuff in technology. And in my early 30s, I rekindled my love of painting um, so I could get away from the keyboard. And I've uh, been painting for a while and doing some various other things that involve uh, computers and technology. And then the neural network stuff kind of reappeared with deep mind around 2014 2015 mm. uh, google's deep dream is obviously um, one of the first things that kind of broke cover for using ai systems to generate imagery um, that was the one that kept generating these kind of weird fractal dog images that's the one it's the one with the puppy slugs yeah yeah <laughs> puppy slugs <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> and so yeah it's kind of kept my hand in it for a long time and i've always been fascinated by the relationship between humans and machines um, and as the technology develops culture develops along with it and i think we're seeing a kind of very interesting uh i say a kind of explosive point in the relationship between humans and machines with our latest wave of ai technology so it's it's kind of a fun place for an artist to be because mm. you know your job is to comment on the culture and uh you know react to it and uh I'm lucky enough to have some of the skills required to play with this technology, which means I can get it to do things that quite often frightens people, which is, I think, why you brought me in. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, you know, 25 years of, you know, AI, you know, deep technical awareness. Um, you know, for most of that time period, AI has been kind of just very slowly moving along this curve. And then it finally seems to hit some kind of very weird elbow in the last sort of six months, maybe a little longer for people that followed it more closely. Um, the obvious answer here is what happens next? Well, I think you need to step back and ask why that happened in the first place. Mm. And um, I'm sure some of the people in the room are old enough to remember about five, 10, maybe 10 years ago that everything was very excited about big data. So as the uh, internet kind of went overground and had mass adoption, mm -hmm. generated an awful lot of data. And people were very excited about this data, uh, but it turns out no one really knew what to do with it mm. or how to handle that volume of data. They think there was something in there, but they weren't sure what it was. Mm -hmm. um, so along comes machine learning, which allows you to effectively mine the statistical properties of large data sets and find out what's going on and maybe use them to your, um, your own purposes. So uh, if you look at the kind of graph of interest, AI follows on from big data by about 18 months. And where we are now is, I think, the consumer, not, I wouldn't say consumer adoption yet, uh, but certainly consumer awareness. I think what Bing is doing today is going to make a big difference, um, and Google are playing catch up on it. So this, this, uh, the big explosion recently has obviously been natural language um, models that have become larger and larger and mm -hmm. become more convincing and in some ways actually useful. I mean, I must admit that I used chat GPT the other day and it's the first time I've ever used an AI and found it useful rather than found it something that I wanted to abuse. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, that's interesting. So it's kind of hit the point where you actually had, it did something useful for you rather than it was just a technical system you were poking for kicks. Absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, uh, as a result of eating so much of the internet, um, it knows or it appears to know things. And yeah. I think the, uh, the, um, the fact that there is a natural language interface to these machines is the is the biggest thing. So I mean, mm. most of the smart assistants like Siri and Alexa and so on, that have been around for a few years, were trying to offer natural language. Yeah. But what and they find is that people tend to moderate their language to try and get the results out. It's just as people moderate their searches on Google to try and get what they want. And on two levels, recent step change has been this: you can chat to it in normal language and get some get an answer back. Like, like, firstly, if you're talking to these, you know, Alexa or Siri or something, you have to speak very cruelly and try and minimize your terribly thick Scottish accent. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the damn thing doesn't understand what you want. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, two times out of three, the response is, I'm sorry, Hal, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then, you know, interacting with even, um, you know, even uh, GPT-3, the site of the order generation chat model, it never has any problem interpreting what you're telling it. You know, yeah, I mean... It, I've never seen it misunderstand a request. It may it may give a terrible answer, but it always appears to understand the question correctly. Well, I think for me, one of the interesting aspects is this: um, there's a there's a kind of tension between the humans and the machines. 
Mm. And, and we do an awful lot of work bringing ourselves to the machine mm -hmm. to help the machine along. And we do that almost subconsciously. And that's, as you say, you kind of carefully use your words or try not to have a Scottish accent if you want to talk to Siri. Mm -hmm. But the change now is that it's, they're much more responsive to just natural language flow. So the illusion is that the machine is more intelligent behind the scenes because you can chat uh -huh. to it. Whereas yes. I think it's an illusion, particularly with large language models. It's, it's a reflection of the statistical nature of language. It's not, it doesn't know anything. Well, this, I mean, this gets into the old thing. What was it? Um, I'm trying to remember, Searles' Chinese Room? Mm -hmm. You know, this whole thing of if you had a statistical machine language translator, you know, you, you follow a set of instructions, it turns one language into another, but the person operating that process has no understanding of Chinese. Does it speak Chinese or not? I, I sort of feel, not to be too philosophical about this, that we don't understand how we operate. And classifying us as operating in a different way to a different system is a bit tricky because we have two systems we don't really understand. And we want to say that they're not equivalent to each other. Maybe. I would love to get into the philosophy, but maybe here is not the place. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that if we're going to focus on the large language models like uh, GPT-3 or um, I don't know what Google's, <clears throat> Google's version is Lambda, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, what they're doing is capturing statistical regularities in the data set. The fact that they've read loads and loads and loads of stuff means they can spit out language that's very convincing. Mm. That is very different, uh, psychologically speaking, to being an evolved animal or a mm. human who lives amongst a culture that has grown up in an, you know, you're an embodied system. You're in a bag of meat that has mm. a whole set of mm. interfaces that have been evolved over millions of years versus a machine that can parrot language in a convincing way. Mm. So quite a lot. I mean, it, Gary Marcus, I'm a big fan of Gary Marcus from back in the day, and he's he's probably the best voice on it at the moment because he keeps shouting from the rooftop saying, look, these things are not intelligent. Just because they look like they're doing intelligent stuff, they do not have the nature, they don't have the, the right equipment to be properly intelligent like we are mm, because mm. they're not made of the same stuff. Yeah. And I think yeah. what's going to happen with the AI um, sort of revolution that's going on now is that it's going to be a new kind of intelligence and it already mm. is a kind of new kind of intelligence It's not human and the the fact that we can chat to them in english or whatever language is is kind of an illusion mm -hmm. um it's a it's it's a thing that makes you very comfortable but it's not really belying the underlying knowledge of what the machines actually know yeah. i think um stephen wolfram did an interesting article about how you tie a machine like chat gpt to an actual knowledge oracle that <clears throat> knows actual stuff about the world in a factual form mm -hmm. so they can correct these language models and, and catch them out when they start lying to you. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it's going to be. It's going to be a kind of hybrid between yeah, complex hybrids, a verifiable knowledge and, you know, the, the frankly, very impressive abilities of these models to talk to you. Mm. I, wrote, um, I wrote a short, uh, well, I wrote a short, long, short story, short book, something like that for national, national novel writing month about 12, 15 years ago. Uh, and in it, the first conscious AI system um, doesn't believe that human beings are conscious because they're basically just meat robots and how can they possibly have consciousness? Uh, and it requires a very long conversation with a very smart person to convince it that humans actually have consciousness. Well, I'm, you know, I'm not fully convinced of that one. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is the fact. Consciousness is epiphenomenal, in my opinion, but, you know, let's say that's a... Uh... I think, uh... Quantum woo. Yeah, well, not quantum woo, more that, uh, as you said, because that that question cannot be fully answered. Yeah. Um, and Obviously. we spend so much of our lives in this illusory, higher order language based activity that we think that's where everything's happening. But, mm -hmm. you know, if I took your cerebellum out, you'd stop breathing, right? And that thing keeps going all the time. We're not so consciously aware of it, but it's part of our biological makeup. And I think, um, uh, you know, the, things like the Turing test are attempts to try and find a way to check if something's conscious or not by using the same modality and systems that we use. Mm -hmm. I think this this thing that's going on with the large language models is very much like that. It's like, oh, wow, this thing's really convincing. Look, if I ask it to write me a piece of code, it will write me a piece of code. But if mm -hmm. you ask it to write a bio of Vinnie Gupta, it will make mm -hmm. up a pack of lies, very mm -hmm. convincing lies, but absolute nonsense. Yeah. And so there's this, uh, the danger of the things that it does well versus the things where it's just going to hallucinate um, needs to be tidied up. And I think mm -hmm. that's what that's going to be the next shift. 
Yeah, I mean, this thing of the spontaneous confabulation is, you know, it, it it sort of limits the use of these systems for recreational use only until it changes. Like, it's fine if it makes up nonsense in a video game setting, but it's a real problem if it does it in a medical setting. Absolutely. I mean, I, there was a, a, a thing on Twitter, wasn't there, about someone trying to set up an AI law firm recently, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which, you know, click a button and I'll write you a cease and desist letter or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> There are many reasons why that's a terrible idea, but I think people are getting the cart ahead of the horse with these language models at the moment. They don't have what you would consider basic intelligence. Like they can't add up. They, can, you know, it's similar with the uh, image generation stuff. You know, if I ask it to put a picture of three apples, there's no chance I'm going to get three apples. It has no concept of three. Right. Um, it has a concept of apples, and perhaps plural of apples, uh, but there's no there's no system under the hood yeah and the, the, the thing with the hands for the concept of extra fingers and so on yeah it I mean, it's, what it's, a hand looks like it just knows that beside a finger there's probably another finger yeah absolutely and i think because it's so persuasive because we live in a culture of other humans that we tend to trust and believe mm -hmm. that when these artificial players come in it's human nature to trust and believe them as well mm -hmm. um, but that mm -hmm. may be premature we've been um We've been doing a bunch of thinking about, you know, how Materium makes use of AI. Um, you know, before Materium, we did a project called Hexerk Capital, where we spent about I don't know, eight, nine months trying to get a VC fund together. And we spent a huge amount of time doing an analysis about future technology. And the thesis was that all the interesting action was going to be for multiple different technologies joined together. So the four things that we thought were going to be big were AI, VR, blockchains, and robotics. And the sort of notion was that, you know, if you've got a company that has a robot that's steered by an AI, both the physical art, the physical elements of robot manufacturing and also the software that makes AI work are both going to improve pretty quickly. And at that point where you've got a product which includes both of those technologies, you get to leverage both sets of improvements. So we were kind of prepped for AI arriving. Um, and we think that there are sort of two from predominant use cases for AI in the context of doing the physical asset stuff that we do. Um, and I want to run those by you and get your kind of feedback on them. So the first is the notion that if somebody wants an AI to go and buy a pair of red shoes for them, um, there has to be a pair of red shoes on sale and the AI has to be able to look at the data that describes the shoes and understand that they're in fact red shoes. Um, and that also gets into things like sizing of shoes, you know, you need a kind of specification. Um, and, you know, you can imagine, because I can imagine something that's almost like an AI eBay or an AI Amazon, where you just have a bunch of very intensely structured data that's properly machine readable and so on. And it's basically intended as a place for AI agents to be able to trust the data that they're making decisions on. Um, does that sound kind of plausible, credible, sensible? Um, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, I think that the... The quest for truth is very important, right? And I think um, truth in AI systems is going to be a very hot topic at the moment, as you say, because there's a lot of confabulation. So the mm -hmm. idea that there's a there's somewhere I can go to find truth about the world is very important. Mm -hmm. Now, be that you know Encyclopedia Britannica or Wikipedia or something that you kind of people trust, that gives you some facts about certain things. But when it comes to stuff in the world, you know, mm. the stuff that Materium cares about, um, having a machine readable format that can be uh, looked at and assessed by another machine is really, really, really valuable, because I don't think anyone else is doing that. Unless I mean, we're barely doing it yet, but, you know, all the back end stuff is XML and JSON for a reason. We started sort of waiting for it. So that I'm glad that sounds kind of credible. The second thing I want to take is a little further out on the branch here. So the inverse operation is that I show an AI the cover of a comic book, and then I ask it, what is this comic book worth? And at that point, presumably somebody has a database and you train an AI and the AI recognizes covers and it's got some you know access to data. Something like a valuation agent or a classifier, do you think that's something that modern AI can support? Or do you think that's still a few years out to the point where you would trust that enough that if somebody wrote a warranty on it, you know, I My AI says this for, uh, is worth a hundred bucks, and if it's wrong, I'll buy it off you for fifty. I think if it's a comic book, that's probably mm. an almost trivial problem. 
for, for mm. image recognition. Uh, mm. It would be harder for a you know a crumpled suit sitting in the corner of your house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the things that are flat and easily readable by a machine, bits of text and stuff, and images are quite simple. But I think phys more malleable physical objects will be harder. If I said I've got a ton of you know aggregate outside my house, do you mm. want to buy it? Taking a picture of a pile of something and yeah. asking an AI to assess is that actually a ton or not? much much harder much harder so yeah. i think it, it depends on the domain <clears throat> i mean we think there's a lot of room for this in for example clothes sizing mm -hmm. you know like right now it's almost impossible to buy garments by measuring your body and then buying something online because the measurements are so impressionistic uh you know clothes are not centimeter size the ebay has its own kind of systems for doing it um but beyond sizing then we get into the question of taste and this this is my kind of final question. So imagine a world where we've got a whole bunch of, let's say, clothing, furniture, things like this cataloged together. You know, each individual item is cleanly described. <clears throat> then we set an AI loose, and the instruction to the AI is, you know, get me an outfit that makes me look 1950s, dress me in 1950s gear for the night, or make me look like a 1987 London punk, or get me an interior that is kind of art deco inspired how credible do you think it is of an ai rummage through a pile of things with nice clean descriptions and actually assemble something that looks like taste um i think that's entirely possible um assuming that the the items are suitably marked up and the inventory is last large enough um i think taste is a fascinating one and uh, we probably don't have time to get into too deep on it, but I think the the one of the problems of uh, systems that are trained on large volumes of data is they kind of have a tendency to the norm. So the taste or the choices tend to be what is most significantly significant. So it may be that my tastes are a little more on the edge of the bell curve and the system may not mm -hmm. necessarily understand. But conversely, you know, they tend to be pluralistic and you know they can support a lot of different things. So I think it's it's technically possible, assuming that the stuff is marked up. I think whether I would trust the taste of an AI would kind of tap into whether I trust the AI as someone like me or not. You know what I mean? And I think that's I think the personality of AI is something you should watch out for for the next couple of years. So at the mm. moment there's one chat GP3 that everyone's talking to, but there's going to be a million and they're going to have different tastes and different attitudes. Oh, wow. There's going to be a you know truth social bot, right, that talks like Trump within oh, my God. days, right? And there's going to be another one that talks about Biden and people will be drawn to whichever flavor of AI that they want to engage with. Yeah. And so yeah, maybe there's going to be a you know classic punk clothing AI that knows all about this stuff, or at least a facet of an AI. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that taste will become apparent. But as long as the stuff's marked up and it's it's plentiful enough, there's no reason why you couldn't do that. Hmm. I've been telling people for years and years and years that you know I, I tweet so much, um, specifically so that one day when we finally have AI, I'll have a huge training data set. You know, all the talks that I've done that record online, everything that I've written that's on the blog, um, and you know, it'll be possible to feed all of this stuff into some kind of system to create a kind of you know effective Robo Gupta. I actually built one on Twitter a few years ago, pre AI, um, Shard Echo, where I took, mm -hmm. I think, the first three years of my Twitter activity and put it through Markov chains and it started spitting out stuff that vaguely sounds like me. Nice. And I mean, I, unfortunately, I think that's probably where we're going to go. I think most, a lot of content is going to be, if not completely written by machines, certainly augmented by machines or perhaps inspired by machines. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of fascinating for what it means for human culture. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what I want from that is I want something that will filter for me. You know, here's a training set of, I don't know, whatever it is, 100,000 tweets. You know, go hit the news and tell me what I'm interested in. And I just sure. wonder, you know, are we close to the point where that kind of augmented filtering is possible, or is that still a few years yet? No, I think that's that's eminently doable. I think I think kind of uh, triaging large volumes of textual data is something that's very much on the cards. Mm. Um, I think making an algo vinay, um you could probably do inside 140 characters, but I'm not sure you'd do it in a webinar just yet. But you know, 18 months. I, mean, I can, think, I can think fake you now, and I could emulate your voice, and I could cross train a GPT-3 to 
write words that sound Vinny like. I mean, that all that technology exists, uh, whether it be convincing or not, I don't know. I, I, well, I mean, uh, I, it, it might be, we should give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> Who says we haven't already been? <laughs> <laughs> Who says that this is the real Vinay? Exactly. <laughs> Five doors. Nice to see you, Eric. <laughs> and you. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. And thank you so much to all of our sp speakers, to Gordon and to James and to Fede uh, and to everybody who has asked questions. Uh, We're going to move on to the after party now there is a link in the chat don't forget to collect your pope your proof of attendance uh, uh protocol token uh there is a link in the chat there as well uh thank you so much everyone a uh, really brilliant conversation and uh i shall see you at the after party in a few moments